So what I just wanted to share with you was three key areas that we've been talking about um, as it relates to really about the human interaction and where machines can kind of interact with us. Um, to give you a bit of bandwidth, in fact, as you read that, I realized my scope has changed again. Um, so our workforce um, initiatives that we work towards are all about developing both internal talent for future roles and where the company is going, but also our local community and um, the workforce that's around us as well. So we kind of serve in two entities um, and our training, we have people globally for certain roles and then we have people very locally for other roles. Um, and my world straddles both our commercial side of the business now as well as our operational side of the business. So it also goes into our sales and marketing teams. Um, and as the organization that we are, we are the world's largest winery. Um, what that means is we do have everything from a $3 bottle of wine up to a $250 bottle of wine. Um, many people don't know the smaller scale. We make things on large scale in our headquarter areas um, where we're churning out 100,000 cases of wine a day to areas where we may only be producing 100 cases in the entirety of the year. So it just depends on the location and they may vary what they're working with as well. The same with our domestic sales and international sales force. They're working very differently depending on those pieces. We're also a fully integrated supply chain if that helps with understanding the scope of what we do. So we make everything from the growing of the grapes or some of our grapes to the bottles that are used, to the labels, to the closures, and then obviously our shipping um, through a three tier distribution um, setup. So it's a very complex business in some ways, but also a very simple business. We make wine, we put it in a bottle and we sell it. Um, but what we have found very much is our talent pipelines are a shortage. So in particular, our frontline team member roles, it's very easy to recruit four year degree candidates into exempt level positions. However, we have found um, the need to develop locally and develop talent locally. And so one of the pieces that we've found through our learning and really through the human centered is people want to come and work within our organization, um, but we're having to drive the needs of our workers and understanding those pieces that we have. And one of the things that we're doing around the community is actually building talent pipelines through our K through 12 partnerships. So we have been going out into, edu into education and actually having the conversations about what is it we need from an organization perspective to develop our students into our future workers. So we work very, very closely with K through 12 partners in having these conversations. And it's amazing. There's a, a huge amount of money out there in California education for career technical education. And what's happening is they're buying simulators, they're buying the latest, greatest robots, they're buying all these different pieces, but they haven't always worked out the application of how does that work to the real world of work or even for the student to be able to get really the skills that are needed for that world of work. So we work very, very closely in helping them think, how does a forklift simulator, for example, great piece of equipment, likened to that of a forklift driver in a, in a warehouse as a material handler. And so we've been working very closely in creating curriculum for them and creating more real life scenarios. So when they go into that world of work, having been playing on a simulator and learning on a simulator, what else do they need to think about? It's a very fine line because with forklifts, for example, they can't get on a physical forklift until they're 18 because of insurances. So we're working with how do we create that environment? What else can they do to understand it? So where's the human piece with the machine piece? We may not be able to reformulate that simulator, but what can we get them to learn that ties into why they need to operate safely, why they need to understand what's around them? So we work very closely in that sense. Um, it's hard. It takes a lot of time. And I think the hardest piece is reality. And what we've also had to do is educate our educators in this is what we do. How does it work to your students? How do we make it real for both of us? So we have the education of our educators in let's come out and see all that we're doing to make it real. And then we kind of had to involve the technology pieces that they're having in the classroom. 
Um, this last year has obviously shown some very interesting connections with school and some challenges as well. And I think as we look at the education side, we run a pre kind of internship program for high school students in the local area. We had to switch that to virtual, just like every education establishment did. It was very, very real, the lack of technology that these students have or access to in their home lives. Um, they may have a computer, but getting them to be on the computer in face-to-face, -face, they all are issued Chromebooks, but some have internet connections at home. Districts were having to find that income or ways to fund internet connections. Luckily, our school districts are used to that and they found that way. But it also was, how do you get a student engaged on a laptop? Um, you know, this industry, this age of where they're just like, it's the technological advance. I can tell you, they're not as technically savvy as we believe them to be. Um, and we had to change a lot of our mindset as well as we went forward with that, which kind of links into the second piece about post-pandemic. And I think post-pandemic learning environment is going to be very interesting. We're a bit curious in the learning and development industry. Um, I sat on a conference and was talking on a conference on innovations and training with Training Magazine. And everyone is in the same. We don't know what our own organizations are going to look like into the future. You know, we've been having this conversation already. Um, I think just the prior points of when do you do something virtually? When do you do something in person? Um, I've been working a lot on team development and understanding some of the dynamics in teams as we work virtually, but also when we work back in the workforce. Um, the most bizarre learning I've ever taught, teaching I've ever done is sitting, standing there in a classroom with a mask on and 10 other people with a mask, nine other people, sorry, with a mask on and not being able to see their expressions. Very different learning in like, you just see the eyes. It's very different as we're talking about difficult situ situations over the internet, much easier. But when we're actually saying we want to do it in person, but the activities we do, and the team building activities are much harder when the social distancing is there. Uh, we're going to have to understand that learners in our classrooms are going to be feeling different. Um, and some may not want to participate. Some may feel uncomfortable as we put them back into groups and are they comfortable with social distancing? We really don't know what this is going to look like. And it's challenging us every day. Um, as I go through some of the design I'm doing, I'm like, can I do this yet? Am I able to do this? How do I do it differently? And we're gonna to have to look at how we use technology, um, but we can't rely solely on a Zoom platform or a WebEx platform or just the general conversation because yes, it's been great for us to bring people globally together um, without the cost of T&E, but that human networking opportunity and that piece, we've got to build better on the virtual platforms and how do we use those platforms and allow people to feel comfortable to discuss. Some organizations are very open and non-judgmental as they use discussion boards. Others don't feel as comfortable, just depends on the organization, but that piece of how do you use that idea, the discussion board? How do you use that platform, especially internally? Externally is much easier in the classroom with people not necessarily feeling as judged because they're coming from different angles, but within internal organizations, you really have to think about that. Um, and it's challenging us as an organization in what is the best way? How do we maximize, and that's what we're looking at post-pandemic, is how do we maximize the use of classroom time? We had always historically been, everything needs to be in a classroom. We need people in the room together, that connectivity. We realize we can deliver virtually, but we're now talking back about how do we bring people back to the classroom and how do we maximize that learning time in the classroom to really be mastering concepts and rather than maybe having that discussion that we would have had before, but really the application of mastering. And is the classroom the right place or is there another way that we can do it? Um, so it's bringing us a lot of, I'm gonna say comfort, but uncomfortableness about what is the right way. Um, and, you know, I'm working with a group at the moment, we're bringing all of our domestic sales organization together in hopefully September, that's 600 people there's going to be a lot of uncertainties as still is about, is it going to happen? Is it not? How are people going to feel? How are people not going to feel? Are people going to feel comfortable in a room with that many people? Um, as we break into like training groups, into groups of 50 to 100, how comfortable are people going to be with that? Um, it's causing logistical nightmares of like, how many rooms do we need? How big a location do we need? 
but as we go through it we just have to think and we have to think about those learners and is there technology we can use to help us or is it something that we really have to be in person for and I think that's the question we just have to constantly ask is can technology help if technology helps how does it enhance and does it cost us or not cost us to do this I think there's been a lot of question around is the investment in technology worthwhile for what we're trying to accrue with as well. And that's been a large, like, what does it look like from an expense perspective? What is it, could it be worthwhile? And how long will that technology last and that machine interaction last for us if we invest into it? Or how easy is it to adjust? Um, I think back, it's gonna date me here, like 20 years ago when e-learning was first coming into organizations, it used to be you had to be a coder to write it. Now you can pick up an Adobe license and you can create it you know, pretty much easily or convert your PowerPoint. That is that difference of affordability of e-learning now compared to say 20 years ago. And I think that's the same with, as we look at AI going in, what does that look like? How does it approach? And we've seen that in discussions as we look at AI and the use of technology of, is it worth the investment for us? Can we control that investment? Can we make the work? Or do we have to always pay a third party? If we have to pay a third party thousands of dollars, we will not make that switch. And that that's that kind of hard piece in, yeah, other people are doing it, but is it really working? Um, I look back at the pandemic and if there was a way that we could have invested in AI to teach our sales force all about the live in an account today moment, um, it would have been fantastic. Where we're looking at AI in particular is in recruitment. And in particular with our high school populations where we may not be able to bring them into the floor, but how could we give them Google glasses? How could we give them you know, AR glasses to be able to walk into the bottling room and hear the sounds and see what goes on in those locations where you have to be 18 or older because of OSHA laws? It doesn't take the heat and the smell and those kind of things that kind of come with it as well, but at least it would give them an idea of what that looks like. So we are looking at it. Um, it just becomes a cost factor for us. The last piece that I was going to talk about was about around how effective learning occurs when instructions in the physical workplace or not. And in a lot of our benchmarking and conference attendings, we've seen all sorts of different things around innovations in learning and the use of classroom versus technology versus a combination. Um, and we always reflect on it back in our workplace as well as what we've seen. And there's been some amazing stuff. So you can go out to the US military and you'll see amazing simulators built, um, but they only cover part of that learning journey. So if you are a new sailor in the Navy, you will go through simulated learning in simulators. Um, and I was talking to a colleague who recently, fairly recently retired from active duty and um, reserve duty. And he used to drive, he used to um, be on the mine, mining ships. And those are those little ones that in the ocean can be a real sick bucket. When I was out um, in San Diego a few years ago, we actually went to the military training and it was fascinating to see the investment on AI and simulators. But the challenge was they did it there in simulated environments. They then had to spend hours at sea to then apply all their learning from the simulators in real life. And one of the biggest differences was the use of motion sickness. And it's gonna sound crazy. In a simulator, to get over the effect of seasickness, you can't do what you do on sea. So when you're on the water to kind of overcome seasickness, you have to look at the horizon. And the horizon moves, but you're watching your eyes as you do. In the simulator, that horizon stays in the same place. And it is very, very sick. It's like the opposite to what it does in the sea. So you're kind of finding yourself feeling, I know how to deal with seasickness, dealt with cross-channel ferries as a young child in rough waters, very much know how to do that. In the simulator, I could not apply that same principle because the horizon wasn't moving. It was moving with the simulator because you were in a, in a simulator. There wasn't that kind of piece. They could not simulate that piece. And they said that, you know, you either are sick from training or you're sick in the ocean, one or the other, because you couldn't simulate it. It was a fascinating mindset to think about how do I make my learning as real as possible and how do I use those AIs to help with that? 
Um, another one I've seen in Benchmark has been UPS. Um, so you think about a UPS driver, they come in and out of that truck all day. It puts a lot of stress and strain on their joints. You may not think about it because you think about going up and down stairs all day, you're putting a strain on your hips. And what they realized is they were getting a lot of injuries that way. So they looked at how could they use technology in their learning to help drivers realize this before they get injured. And what they do now is in their training centers. So all drivers go through training and training centers and they have a, um, a weight bearing platform that you step down onto and it shows the impact of when you step out of your cab, what's the impact? And they have the correct way and the, the way that other people decide to do it. And the correct way, you can see holding onto the bar on the side of the truck, it takes the, um, it takes the impact of the weight. People may not realize that, but when you put your hand on there, the impact goes through on the bar. And you see that on a screen. Once you've done it, you can look at the screen and it shows the difference. So you can try getting in and out of the truck different ways. And then you do the way that you're trained and you can see that different impact on your body. Great way of using machines to help you really truly understand the impact of that learning um, we've talked about it often like should we as we bring people in for 12 weeks of training could we cut down the time they're outside in 100 degree heat or 90 to 100 degree heat in the summer and the answer has been no we can't because all of the things that we want to simulate they need the heat, they need the light, they need maybe the smell and the slips and the trips. And it's really hard to simulate that in an environment. We can simulate the weight. We might be able to put them in like, a, I mean, I joke, we could put them in a Bikram yoga, yoga studio with AI glass, like an AI simulation or an AR simulation going, but that's not the ideal to what the workplace is like. I can't take them into the confined spaces of a tank to realize that cl whether claustrophobia gets them or not, or heights, we see fear of heights as people climb to the tank tops. Um, a 600,000 gallon tank is very different than a 100,000 gallon tank. I would rather get in a 600,000 gallon, but I still don't really want to, versus a 100,000 gallon. And you can't replicate that. And so you have to be really careful as you look at it. Um, of, is this the latest, greatest, shiny object that we want to embed into our training? Or do we really, think this is going to help us and we often cross this bridge and part of my world now is taking on learning technology and there's been a lot of conversation about how do we make it accessible to all can we use it can we use devices um, how do we make learning one-stop shop right there um, and we have that we're talking about the use of qr codes at equipment centers so if we can't remember how to lock out a piece of equipment we can scan that qr code and that document will come to us that may be when machines become intelligent for us. And that's probably where our comfort level is. Um, a lot of it is, do you need that science? I mean, when I think about machines and human learning, it's about how do they complement? How do they work together? And if it's not the latest, greatest, shiny object, is it really going to help us? Or is it just an investment sucker? And that's what we have to look at it. It's like, do you invest in something for your business? It's exactly the same as do you invest for your training? And you have to look at that outcome. Does it outweigh or not? Technology is coming down in price, but we still are scared because it's something unknown to us at times. And we just have to decide, are we willing to take that risk? Mm -hmm.